Amen. It is a, a joy to worship God in spirit and in truth, uh, in song, and even as we move into this time now, to worship God as the word of the Lord goes forth, that we be attentive to hear and to pay attention, to give heed to the word of the Lord. The text of scripture that I would like for us to consider this morning is found in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 1. As you know, we have been through the entirety or most of Mark 1, and now we find ourselves in the last few verses. How fitting it is that this being our last Sunday, we are in the end of this chapter, bringing it to a close. So we're going to begin in verse 40 of Mark chapter 1. Go to verse, we're going to read all the way down to verse 45, and then we'll go back through it all. And this is the, the narrative of Christ's cleansing the leper. Mark 1.40 reads, And the leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him, and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest." And offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely. And to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. But stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. Let us pray that God would bless the preaching of His Word. Father, I do pray that very thing, that You, by Your Spirit, would bless the preaching of Your Word, that You would enable me to make known the truth of this passage with accuracy, with clarity. And I pray for those who hear that we would be affected, that those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ would be blessed, would be encouraged in our pilgrimage to the celestial city. That those who are lost would be saved. And that above all, Christ would be brought to glory. The one who is able to cleanse those who are filthy. The one who is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. We pray that Christ would be glorified. In this, in this day and in all things forevermore. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is The Cleansing of the Leper. When we think about, brethren, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and specifically His healing ministry, and we think about the purpose it is for us, the, the purpose it serves for us, what are these narratives that we find in the Gospels, specifically the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and some in John, but mostly in these three Gospels, of Jesus healing various people. And in this particular narrative, Jesus healing a leper. We know that the Scriptures are written for our instruction and for our edification. Paul tells us that. At least the Old Testament texts were, and of course the New Testament text was. It was written to bring encouragement to the people of God. So what specifically does this narrative and really the rest of the healing narratives serve for us? Certainly do they show us that Christ is able to heal. That Christ is able to take someone's physical afflictions and remove them completely by His own power. He did it then and He certainly can do it now. And He does. Not to the extent that He did then and not as often, but He still does providentially. But above that, what, is, what are these narratives really showing us? Certainly they are showing those things, as I mentioned. But beyond that, 
They are showing us Christ's ability to heal the inner man. To heal men of the, the disease of sin. The corrupting power of transgressions and iniquity. They show us that Christ is able to cleanse sinners of sin. For we find in many of these narratives that these people weren't merely cleansed of their outward afflictions, but also of their inward iniquity. They were saved from the power of sin, and ultimately that is what Christ came to do. To seek and to save the lost. To die as a ransom for many. To purchase eternal redemption for His elect. And so as we consider this particular narrative, the cleansing of the leper, let us keep that in mind. That is showing us that very thing. Christ is able to cleanse man of his sin to the uttermost. And so this narrative specifically breaks up very cleanly into four different parts. And so there are four things I want us to look at. One is the leopard's plea, Jesus' response, the result of Jesus' response, and lastly, Christ's warning and the man's evangelism. Before we look at this text, though, as we always ought to do, when we look at a passage of Scripture, we need to contemplate the context. And if you will remember, the last sermon I preached in Mark 1 was on Jesus' stressing the importance of His preaching ministry. As you know, it says in verse 35, verse 35 that Jesus went out in the early morning to pray. It says in verse 36 that His disciples looked for Him and they found him and they told him, everyone is looking for you. That's verse 37. And we know that he says in verse 38, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also. For that is what I came for. And he went away, or excuse me, and he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Here we see Jesus' gospel proclamation ministry highlighted for us. Here we see that Jesus stresses the importance of His own preaching ministry. It was important to our Lord to make known the gospel of God's glorious grace. And that brings us there to the doorstep of verse 40. And so as I said, I want us to look at four things. Firstly, the leopard's plea. Secondly, Jesus' response. Thirdly, the result. And fourthly, Christ's warning and the man's evangelism. So let us consider the first one of those points. That is the leopard's plea. The leopard's plea. Verse 40. The man came to Christ. He came to Christ. Look at the first part of verse 40. It says, in a leper came to Jesus. A leper came to Jesus. This man was a, afflicted with a particular disease that affected the skin and the nerves on the skin and under the skin. It was a, a terrible disease to have, especially in Jesus' day. Nowadays, it's, it's very uh, treatable and curable. And uh, what I re Through my research, I found that in 2015 in the United States, there was only over 60 cases. Very rare these days. It's been almost abrogated by modern medicine. However, in Jesus' day, it was a common issue that people dealt with. And this man was one of the people who were afflicted with this. Luke highlights in his gospel, in Luke 5.12, that the man was covered with leprosy. That's what it says. It says, while he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. So Luke adds, being what many scholars would believe, a physician, Luke adds this important fact that the man was, not only did he just have leprosy, he was covered in it. He was, he was afflicted to a great extent with this particular disease. We also know from historical records that the Jewish people considered leprosy a judgment of God upon the particular person. 
because of their sin. Because they had committed some great iniquity against the Most High, God had smote them with this disease. However, that's not necessarily true, scripturally speaking, in every case. Certainly we find examples in Scripture where people are afflicted with a particular disease because of their sin. We see it with Miriam murmuring against Moses. She was afflicted with leprosy. But that's not always the case. This man very well could have served and honored and glorified God with his life. And that is true that there are many Christians who are suffering even at this present moment, who have had suffered physical ailment. Not because they did anything wrong, but because God was pleased in His sovereign plan to allow them to suffer. We must realize that. That sometimes it is the will of God for us to suffer. Sometimes it is the will of God for the righteous to be afflicted. In fact, Oftentimes, it is the will of God for the righteous to suffer. That may fly in the face of the prosperity gospel, but that is true. It is true. And so this man, afflicted with leprosy, comes to Jesus. This is showing us how we ought to come to Christ. This is showing us not just merely that Jesus is able to cleanse from a phys physical affliction, but that Christ is able to save from sin. This man is, is really, at this point in the text, is a, a perfect representation on how we are to come to Christ. And we are to come. Come. The sinner is not called to cleanse himself and to clean his own life up before he comes to Christ. The sinner is not barred from the Savior until he is well enough to approach Him. Rather, the sinner must come to Christ in the state that he is in. We do not come to Christ because we have cleansed ourselves. We come to Christ to be cleansed. We do not come to Christ because we have made ourselves right. Rather, we come to Him so that we might be made right. And we must understand the difference between the two. Brethren, when we call a family member or a friend or a stranger on the street to repent and to believe the gospel, we need to, to be sure that they understand that repentance and faith are not things that we do to come to Christ. They are the things that we do and they are coming to Christ. Repenting and having faith in Christ is coming to Christ. Don't let them think that they must do those things first. And then come. Otherwise, we are preaching a works gospel. Rather, repenting of sin and coming to Christ, or returning to Christ in faith, is those two things together, or one and the same, are coming to Christ. That's what it means to come to Christ. The man who had leprosy wanted to leave his leprosy. He didn't want it anymore. He was sick of it. He was afflicted with it. But instead of trying to clean himself up and save himself, from this affliction, which he could not do. He understood he was hopeless in and of himself. Medicine at that time was not developed to really provide him with any sort of hope. And so he comes. As Luke tells us, covered with leprosy. So is the sinner called to come, covered in their sin, to be cleansed by the Savior. Notice also... He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Continuing in verse 40. It says, a leper, And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees before him. He did not merely come. He came with humility. He came humbling himself before the one who could cleanse him. Before the one who could save him from his present peril. He came to Christ and he fell on his knees. We know from elsewhere in the New Testament that he fell on his face. One of the other synoptic gospel writers tells us he fell on his face. 
He hits the ground before the Lord Jesus Christ. He casts himself upon the mercy of the Son of God. He humbles himself. Let's go of any self-hope, self-confidence. <clears throat> Kneeling before one was and still is even in this very present culture a sign of humility. Mark 10, 17 tells us, it says as Jesus as he was, and that's speaking of Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We know that that's the narrative of Jesus and the rich young ruler. In that situation as well, the rich young ruler kneels before Christ with a measure of humility. So does this man covered in leprosy. And that is likewise a picture of how the sinner is to come to Christ. With a total abandoning of self-confidence. And seeing oneself as they truly are in the eyes of God. A sinner, a sinner, a sinner. Filthy. But seeing how wonderful, how majestic, how glorious Christ is. They kneel before Him as it were. They bow the knee. They fall prostrate before the Son of God, just as the angels do. He came, he humbled himself, he petitioned, he petitioned. Continuing, verse 40, it says, and falling on his knees before him, and saying, if you are willing, you can make me we know that Matthew 8 2 tells us that the leper said Lord if you are willing you can make me clean Matthew provides us with extra information he addresses Lord as kurios as the Lord of glory as the sovereign one He addresses him as Lord. He petitioned. He asked. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. Not and it will be open for you. The sinner ought to come to Christ, ought to humble himself, and then ask. Ask for eternal life. Ask for forgiveness of sin. Ask for the righteousness of Christ to be given to you. Ask. We think to ourselves, is it really that simple? Absolutely. Oftentimes, as adults, we are so prideful. So prideful. And we hold ourselves aloof from God, as it were, saying, there is no way it could be that easy. There must be more. Rather, for a child, it is very simple. If you tell them, ask, and it will be given to you, what do they do? Ask, and they expect to receive. That is why our blessed Lord told us we must be as children to enter the kingdom. We must be as simplistic as a child is. Not childish, rather childlike. Simply trusting that what God has said is true. Is true. Also, this plea from the leper has a very important lesson contained in it about the sovereignty of God in prayer. Very briefly, I want to touch on that. <coughs> when Jesus taught us to pray in his Lord's Prayer, he said, Our Father is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is the heart of prayer ultimately? It is a, it is a pleading with God that His secret will would be accomplished. The will which we do not know would be, would be playing out in our own lives and would be 
happening on this earth as it happens in heaven. And we see here that the leper understands that Christ is the sovereign one, not the leper. That the leper is not in control, Christ is in control. That the leper has no claim upon even his own life, and he, Christ has all authority and all power to do as he pleases with anyone. And so he comes and says, if you are willing. He doesn't try to bend the Lord Jesus' arm, as it were, to do what he wills. Rather, he says, if you're willing, Lord, you can make me clean. And that ought to be the heart of prayer. When we go to God in prayer, let us begin almost every prayer with these four words. If you are willing. If you are willing. You can do this. You can answer this prayer. You can save this person. You can subdue this sin in my life. You can help my marriage. You can. If you're willing. God is pleased when we are submissive in that manner in prayer when we are submitted to the sovereign decree of God truly then do we find ourselves in genuine prayer secondly I would like for us to consider Jesus' response Jesus' response look with me in verse 41 Jesus' response notice his compassion his compassion Beginning there, verse 41. Moved with compassion. Notice it does not say with compassion. Rather, the text reads moved with compassion. In other words, it's as if it's saying the Son of God was filled with such a great measure of compassion that it moved Him to do this very thing. Not that the God of glory is somehow whimsical or moved by, his, by passions or lusts. It's not what it means but rather that Christ is a compassionate Savior. We see it in the cleansing of this leper, that he was moved with compassion. And we know, of course, by these three words, that he was willing. He was willing. He had compassion for this poor, miserable sinner. This unclean man. Not only was he unclean physically speaking, but because of his leprosy, the Jewish people and the Old Testament text itself clearly indicates that if one had leprosy, they were unclean. They were ceremonially unclean. They could not stand before God. They could not enter into the temple. They were separated from the people. And here we see Jesus is moved with compassion for this unclean man. Here, this is a promise. Do you see this? This is a promise for the lost. This is a promise for sinners. That if one comes to Christ with humility... Petitioning Christ to save them from their sin, he is moved with compassion. What did Jesus say? For the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. That's definitive. I will not cast anyone out who comes to me. And brethren, this is not only showing us how a sinner is to come to Christ for eternal life, but even as a believer, how we are to come to Christ continually. Do you realize that our practice as Christians, day after day after day, is to come to Christ over and over and over? We come back and back again because He is the source of eternal life. He is our life. He is the resurrection of the life. He is the bread of life. We feed upon Him. And so we come. Even as believers, we have sin in our lives. We must be cleansed of. We must be purified from. We must be sanctified. And so we come pleading, Lord, if you are willing, 
You can obliterate this sin in my life. You can subdue it, for it is your enemy, O Lord Christ. And you will subdue all your enemies. The Father is making all your enemies the footstool of your feet. And Christ surely will be moved with compassion. And will touch His people. And cleanse them. That leads me to the next thing. Continuing verse 41. Jesus touches this man. What does it say? Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. So much is here in this one passage. He touched the man. What did that mean for Jesus? Well, if he was merely man, it meant that he was unclean. Now, for he had touched someone who was ceremonially unclean. And yet when Jesus comes down and he touches a leper, they are clean. Rather than he himself being made unclean, they are clean. To take it further, when Christ reaches down and touches a sinner, their sin is put away. Christ does not become a sinner. Their sin is forgiven. Their sin is washed away. How can that be? Because he was treated as a sinner as a sinner upon the cross. He was treated as a vile wretch upon the cross. And so he has the right, the power, and the ability to touch those who are unclean. And we see further stress is Jesus' willingness. Mark includes this. It says, and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. Five words. Simple, yet so profound. As said earlier, Christ is willing. Those who come, Christ is willing. As I think about the day of judgment and those who will be cast into hell, what are some of the things the Lord might say? We know that He will say, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Perhaps He Himself will say, I was willing, but you did not come. But you were not. But you were not. See, when we go and we make the gospel known to the lost, we are inviting them. We are saying, come, because we know that Christ is willing to save those who come. And so we have confidence. We have confidence. Thirdly, let us consider the result. The result. The result was immediate healing. Look at the beginning of verse 42 with me. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he was cleansed. He was cleansed. As mentioned already, this is not only true for the physical realm, but for the spiritual realm. For believers and unbelievers, there is instant cleansing available. Really briefly, so we understand the nature of Jesus' healing ministry, turn with me to Luke 17. Beginning in verse 11. Luke 17, 11. This is another narrative in one of the synoptic gospels of Jesus healing lepers. He actually heals multiple lepers here. Uh, and I just want you to consider this very briefly. Verse 11 says, While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. Verse 13, 
And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So we find very, so something very similar happening. What we see in Mark 1. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were not ten cleansed, but the nine? Where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Literally, your faith has saved you. That's powerful. That's profound. Christ healed these men even when he was not with them. And they were on their way to the priests. And one of them returns back glorifying God. It was a powerful thing to be cleansed of this horrible disease in Jesus' day. I'm trying to bring you back in time to understand how bad this was. You were cut off from family and friends. You were an outcast. You were now a hermit. A nobody. Left to suffer. Considered someone who was an enemy of God. Under the wrath and judgment of God because you had this horrible disease. It was a bad thing, but Christ cleansed these men. This is a beautiful picture of salvation. I can't stress it enough. Look at what Gill says. Listen to what uh, the, the great commentator John Gill had to say about this passage. He said, but if the leprosy covered all his flesh, then he was pronounced clean. And such was this man. He was a very lively emblem of a poor, vile sinner full of sin and iniquity, who is brought to see himself all over covered with sin. When he comes to Christ for pardon and cleansing, and is so considered by Christ the high priest, when he applies his justifying righteousness and sin-purging blood to his conscience. When the sinner comes and is cleansed, there's a cleansing of the conscience as well. Lastly, I want us to consider Christ's warning and the man's evangelism. This is the fourth point. Verse 43. Listen to Jesus' warning. Jesus' warning. Verse 43. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest." And offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So Jesus here is giving this man a stern warning. He's pleading with this man, don't do this. Don't tell anyone. Rather, go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. Now this is found in Leviticus 13 and 14. Leviticus 13 specifically talks about leprosy. And, and how that affected the person specifically and their place in society and so on and so forth. And Levis, uh, then, uh, Leviticus 14 talks about how they are to be cleansed. Uh, and it's a very lengthy process. I was actually going to read Leviticus 14, but as I studied that passage, I realized that I have to read about the entire chapter. So I encourage you, uh, if you'd like to go home and study that text and see how detailed it was of uh, the cleansing of a leper. But there were multiple sacrifices involved, and there were multiple waiting periods, and so on and so forth, for the, the official cleansing of the leper, ceremonially speaking. Even though he had already been physically healed of the disease itself. But Jesus commands him to do this thing. Why? What was the purpose? Why would Jesus send this man away like that to go to the priest? What was, what was Jesus getting at? What was the purpose? It was a testimony. It was a testimony. The Greek word there for testimony is martyrion. Martyrion. Which is actually where we get the word martyr. Martyr. So we talk about someone who, who's been martyred for the faith. They're, they die as a testimony to the faith. It's interesting. I never, I never knew that. Mar that. That's where the word uh, martyr came from. It's testimony. 
Jesus is telling this man, go so that the priests see the power of God to cleanse, to save, to redeem. Now I want us to consider verse 45, the man's evangelism. Now this is profound. I want you to understand the significance of this last verse of this chapter. It says, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around. This man was so overcome with the glory of Christ, was so in awe of the power of God that had just been manifested in his life, he goes out and he begins to proclaim it freely. And to spread the news around. This man is doing full on hardcore evangelism. To such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. That's what the text says. To such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from everywhere. So Jesus stays in the cities, he stays out in the country, and even then the people are coming to him from everywhere. The leper's testimony, <coughs> the leper's evangelism was so powerful and so effective that the people are crowding they are leaving the cities. They're going out of the country. They're going to find this Christ. To have some of what this leper just received. Grace. Unmerited favor. This is also telling of something. Of a few things, actually. One is the glory of Christ. How powerful the glory of Christ is. How wonderful. When someone catches a glimpse of the glory of God, there is a sense in which they cannot contain it. They can't hold back. They cannot keep quiet. They would rather die than live on and not be able to tell of the glory of God. We see it in this man. For Jesus sternly warned him not to do it. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely. And it's interesting. Jesus is all-powerful. Jesus is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knows all things. He's all places. He has all power. And yet, he did not stop this man. Rather, in his divine providence, he allowed it to continue. <coughs> That's power. This is telling of how the believer reacts. When someone encounters the glory of God, they cannot but help to make it known. They must tell of the story. They must tell of the Savior. They must. When someone is converted, they now have a heart for evangelism. They now have a heart for evangelism. Every believer, every true believer has a heart to share the gospel. Not every believer is called to be an evangelist. Capital E, that is. But every believer is called to be an evangelist. Lowercase e. We are all evangelists. We've all been sent out to make known the gospel. In fact, I will submit to you in the words of Charles Spurgeon, if you do not have the desire for your neighbor to be saved, you are not yourself. You can be sure of that. If you don't have the burden for other people to have salvation in Christ, you just don't have it. That is straightforward. And that's clear. That's clear. 
We see an example of this in Isaiah. Isaiah 6. We don't have to turn there, but briefly, Isaiah 6. I've read this passage before. Isaiah sees the glory of God. He sees the angelic host crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. He says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among the people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. There's this glorious encounter with the living God. There is this glorious encounter with Yahweh. Then we see this in verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Immediately after the prophet beholds the glory of Christ, we know that that was Jesus he saw from John 12. He immediately says, I want to go. I want to tell. And so God conditions him. But God says there, these people's hearts are hard. They're hard. Oh, that we would make Christ known to those who are around us. To the nations. To our community. Oh, that we would. There's so much talk in churches about foreign missions. And as just mentioned earlier, clearly I have a heart for foreign missions. I do. I want to see the gospel go to the nations. I want to see believers sin out, go to a foreign land, never come back, and stay there and make Christ known. I want to see that. I do. But brethren, do you realize this? That it costs you nothing to be a missionary right here? It costs you nothing? You already are here? You've lived in this culture? You've lived amongst His people. They know you. You know them. You know where they're at. Think about all that is going for you. You're in the mission field. This place needs the gospel. Needs the true gospel. Enough of American Christianity. It needs the true biblical Christianity. The true Christian religion. People need true religion. Not pseudo-religion. Brethren, we are missionaries right here. The man who was cleansed of his leprosy, he did not say, Oh, I've been cleansed. I need to go to China. Rather, what did he do? He made Christ known to such an extent that the people in the areas, in the cities, crowded Jesus so much, he goes out of the country. And even then they follow him. Oh, brethren. Oh, brethren, we're called to make Christ known. In that text in Isaiah 6, when it says, when God says, who will go for us? And God there sins and commissions Isaiah. Do you realize that God has already sinned and commissioned you and me? Already. It's official. It is written down. It is in holy writ. It's there in the word of God. We've already been sent. So let us go and make Christ known. Brethren, I exhort you to consider some of the truths that have been propounded this morning. To consider these realities. To consider the cleansing power of Christ. The cleansing power of the cross. Of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are cleansed by the blood. The precious blood of Christ. To consider how you've been cleansed of your iniquity. Brethren, I exhort you to invite. To plead. To command others. You have authority. Not that you yourself do, but we have authority from God. When we speak God's word, when we say, sinner, come, we're not saying, oh, I have the authority to tell you so. We're saying God himself has sent us. We have a divine decree from the Most High. Come, sinner. Go and plead with him. And even as a believer, we must come to Christ day after day like a poor leper, like a poor beggar. Pleading for grace. Day after day, cast, casting ourselves upon the mercy of God. 
I exhort you to do these things. You who are lost. You who are covered in sin. As this man was covered in leprosy. Covered in the disease of iniquity. Your life has been destroyed by sin. Your soul has been destroyed by the sin of Adam. As we know that you were born in this state of deadness and sin. You need salvation. You need cleansing and forgiveness. You need to be made new. This man, notice the change. He's not only cleansed, he's now new. He now goes and makes Christ known. So too do you need to be changed and be saved so that you might make Christ known, that you might be a vessel of grace, a vessel of mercy to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are perhaps some of you who think yourselves to be clean but are still dirty in sin. I exhort any of you who think yourselves to be clean to exhort to examine yourself and to see has the work of God been wrought in my heart? Has the saving grace of God been poured out in my life? Do I truly desire that my neighbor be converted? And not only do I desire it, but do I act on that desire? Do I seek to make Christ known? Even in small ways. I'm not saying you're this eloquent person who's able to present the gospel with such clarity. <coughs> oh, brethren, how simple it is to take a tract out of your pocket and let a godly Christian author share the gospel with that person through the tract. Even the most simple-minded, immature Christian can share the gospel. So if you see that you need cleansing, come. Come as the leper did. Humble yourself and plead for mercy. So we have seen here in these five verses the leper's plea, Jesus' response, the result of Christ's response and Christ's warning and the man's evangelism. This God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the true God, the eternal God, is holy. We see it there in Leviticus when I talked about the leprous person being unclean. We are all in that state by default. This uncleanliness, this being separated from God and God being separated from us. He has shown much grace and mercy, giving us life. But we must realize that we are still unholy. For He has said, you shall not steal or lie or blaspheme. But we have done these things and we deserve hell. But God being rich in mercy, chose a people to save in His Son. And Christ came and lived for those people and died upon the cross to satisfy the wrath of God against the sin of those people. And He was raised on the third day and He is alive forevermore. And the call of the Gospel, as I said earlier, is repentance and faith. To turn from sin and to turn to God. To come as the leprous man did. And the promise is that one will be forgiven and wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ by grace. And that they will be given a new nature so that they will be like the leper's man, going out and making Christ known. And it will be their delight. This gospel is not for the salvation of the lost merely, but for the delight of the believer's heart. It is for the edification of the Christian. It is all by grace. This healing of this leprous man was by grace. All salvation is by grace. It's all by grace. And ultimately, it's for the glory of Christ. This passage that exposits the power of Christ to heal, 
is for His glory. That's the purpose of all things. The glory of God. So may God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the one true God, be all glory in all things forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, I plead that you would bless it as it has gone forth. And truly, may you be glorified, Father, in us and in our futures and all that we do. In the name of your Son, I pray these things. Amen. Amen.